Fair's purpose is to promote education and knowledge in the built environment. And we like to do that, if we can, uh, where there is an emphasis on the interdisciplinary nature of design between architecture and engineering, uh, and of course beyond that to social science and economics. And our relationship with the LSE here is, is a long one, because we were the uh, original funders for the highly successful cities program here alumni from which are now working all over the world making a really big difference in issues of urban design. And we're still involved with the uh, LSE in funding two uh, uh, teaching fellows here on the city's program. And of course we're funding uh, this uh, lecture tonight uh, and the series, there are three of them, three public lectures. I'm quite certain that this lecture will fit our purpose of promoting knowledge and education in the built environment. Uh, uh, we're, I'm quite certain we're all looking forward to it and that we'll take something from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you to all the trustees of the Over Arab Foundation, who supported us for so long and continue to do so. Um, my job is a very happy one to introduce uh, Rit Beriagard, uh, the former mayor of uh, Copenhagen. As and I said, obviously not very elegantly a moment ago, uh, it's very fortunate she isn't anymore the mayor of Copenhagen because she can come and talk to us. <laughs> Otherwise, she would have been too busy to do that. So I am absolutely delighted. We have a fan club. Uh, here of uh, your city um, and um, it is uh, many years that we've wanted to have you come and speak here so it's really very very important that we uh, have you and in a way have you after the event and I think that's quite interesting because you might be able to reflect on some of the issues that perhaps last year you would have not been able to reflect on so openly. Um, I think as um, Richard has already said the fact that the Arab Foundation and LSE Cities uh, ha are very interested in the relationship between infrastructure of cities at many levels, at the levels of the physical design, the transport system, but also those interrelationships between the infrastructure, as we normally talk about it, and the social and the governance side. There really is no other city that I can think of that brings these worlds together in such a strong way. I mean, quite literally, I think, over the last 10, 15 years, the more we study cities here, um, at the LSC, the more we realize that there is uh, uh, one way of doing things, and in many ways that's the Copenhagen uh, way. Uh, this statistic that I've heard, which may or may not be right, struck me a number of years ago, that um, Copenhagen as a city, uh, over the last sort of 30 or 40 years, so a very long time scale, was able to maintain a high quality of life. People have earned a lot of money. The Danes work well and uh, produce well. But it's also one of the few, if not only, city that up to a few uh, years ago had at the same time as increasing the GDP per capita actually dropped the amount of energy people used. Now that's an extraordinary and important fact for all of us who are interested in trying to resolve the problems of the world. In other words, the message there is very simple, that wealth, increased wealth, need not go with increased energy consumption. Uh, and that takes an enormous amount of investment in physical infrastructure and social infrastructure and governance. And Rit really is someone who's cut across many of these levels uh, of governance and most recently, of course, in running uh, Copenhagen. Uh, she was a very, very forceful EU commissioner for the environment uh, from in the late 90s, the sort of last five years, uh, where she really provided strong global leadership by bringing the US and Europe together. She was, in fact, uh, present given her role, a very important role, at the Kyoto negotiations in 97. And was, of course, uh, mayor of Copenhagen. I think it's called Lord Mayor there, if I'm yeah. correct, um, until December of uh, last year, where she was instrumental in actually bringing uh, this COP15 uh, conference of cities there, where in many ways 
you could argue that cities show that they're much better at doing things about the environment than their equivalent nation states. I'm sure we'll hear about that. I just want to uh, say one or two more things about why Copenhagen is important to us before asking Rit to um, describe her vision of the city and the environmental agenda and how important it is. In many ways, Copenhagen uh, has really enviable statistics in terms of the issues that uh, we're concerned with. It was one of the first, if not the first, city to have a, a free bicycle sharing scheme and uh, cycle parks around the stations. Even today, it has something like 37, 38% of people who actually cycle to work. In London, it's still around 2 or 3%, even though in two months' time, that might actually increase. Uh, the number of people who use public space as pedestrians but enjoy the public spaces in the city center has actually tripled in the last decades. That is, more people hang out and enjoy the public spaces of the city uh, and use it more. That has meant that more young people, students in particular, have started living in the center and reversed the trend that happens in so many uh, European cities of basically city centers emptying out or becoming really the privilege of people from my age and upwards. Uh, so I think these are all things which are very significant. While she was mayor, a number of important things happened. Just two things to remind us is that a new and wonderfully elegant um, uh, underground system, subway system, has been designed and implemented. You can actually take your bicycle from the suburbs into the underground system, if you can imagine that, and then get out in the city center and ride to work. There are also car parking, sorry, wrong word, cycle parking spaces right next to uh, the tube stations in the middle of the city, which I must say are designed like uh, the sort of the um, BA first class lounge by comparison to the sort of environments that we have here. And last statistic, which is really quite mind blowing, is that 96% of all buildings in Copenhagen are heated by a district heating system. In other words, in terms of just setting the standard of uh, uh, efficiency and reducing wastage and uh, resource and improving resource efficiency is really quite extraordinary. Now, uh, what one mayor can do in four years, let's say, is perhaps limited, but it does show uh, that there's a lineage of the stewardship uh, in city making, of which RIT uh, is a very, very important player, and therefore, can you join me in welcoming her to speak at the LSE on Copenhagen and the environmental issues? Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the night's nice, uh, introduction. I, I think you could almost have uh, taught the audience what I would like to tell with all the knowledge you have about uh, Copenhagen. But a very, very warm uh, thank you to the London School of uh, Economics for inviting me here tonight. Since English is not my mother tongue, I will stick to my uh, document uh, here and not just uh, talk because uh, it could give me some difficulties. So I will do that and afterwards I hope that we will have a nice uh, debate. As former Commissioner, Minister and uh, Lord Mayor, I have spoken at many outstanding venues but never before at the uh, LSE. So it is hence a great honor to speak to you tonight and I trust we will have an interesting hour and a half together. I understand that uh, the motto of the LSA is rerum cognoscere causes. And just to put it in your own language, to understand the causes of things. This is a good point of departure for a university like LSE, but also for tonight. The things I would like to highlight the causes of are primarily Copenhagen's role as host of the COP15 and the role of cities, some words about the Copenhagen climate plan, and finally a few remarks about the pursuit of a better life quality in cities. I hope you will enjoy it. So let us start by going back exactly one year to June, the 1st of June 2009. Everyone was at that time looking forward to COP15 with a clear expectation that we would get a new binding global climate agreement to substitute the expiring Kyoto Protocol 
in 2012, which, as already mentioned, I were lucky enough to be able to negotiate together all for the EU. But a year later, we know we had to settle for much less. It was only a political declaration which may and may not play a part for a binding international agreement. But I think it is not on the horizons either for the COP16 in Mexico or COP17 in South Africa. With the UN track clearly on the defensive from the outcome of Copenhagen, we have a couple of options. We can wait for better times. As you know, one can always wait for better times. Or, I think better, look at where the climate actions and concrete solutions to what change are happening and how to proceed. Not surprisingly, I will address the second option. And I would like to refocus from a national to a local view that of the cities, even though you might argue that cities are both national and global. Today, more than half of the world's population is living in the cities, and the number is rising. It is hence now no more normal to live in the city than not. Cities of the world are responsible for about 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions and are some of the biggest polluters in the world. In other words, the cities face huge challenges to clean up their acts. So cities are definitely part of the problems and they need to be part of the solution. My former colleague from tonight's host city, London, Nikki Gavron, has said it very clear and I quote, the fight against climate change will be won or lost in the cities, quote end. Or stated by the Clinton Foundation, and I quote again, cities can play a leadership role in catalyzing global action to address climate change. In addition to being more nimble and willing to take risks than larger government bodies, cities have easy access to their citizens and local businesses, schools and institutions, and therefore the effects of new policies are immediate and meaningful." End quote. But why focus specifically on cities? Why not simply develop generic solutions at national level? The answer is that cities have special environmental concerns that require tailored solution. As an example, the share of energy used for residential and commercial heating in US is about 10%, whereas, and we are again talking about US in general, transport takes up 29%. But if instead we look to New York, the figures are quite different. Because in New York, residential heating and cooling take up almost 80% of the energy consumption and transport only about 10%. So it's very clear that a national solution would hence focus on transport while Mayor Bloomberg wisely looks at retrofitting of buildings as his main area of concern. And I'm sure that there are a lot more examples to come up with. So city problems require city solutions. Yet cities were up until recently largely ignored as relevant partners in the quest for sustainable climate solutions. At the COP15 in Copenhagen, UN officials and national delegation had a dedicated entrance while the mayors had to queue up together with the NGOs. Not a bad word about the NGOs, but with half the world's population and 75% of emissions under our roofs, 
we should enter the negotiations through the main entrance. That is why we need groups like ECLI and C40. ECLI is the Association of Local Governments for Sustainability, representing more than 1,000 cities from about 68 countries. C40 consists of 40 of the world's leading cities in action to cut their CO2 emission. I'm very proud and honored that Copenhagen, during my time as Lord Mayor, has become one of the C40's exemplary sustainable cities. And I'm very thankful to Ken Livingstone and Mayor Bloomberg, who took the initiative to form this body C40 and for arranging meetings in New York and Seoul because it was very instrumental and that meant that mayors know more about each other. To help the cities play the part they must in the climate negotiations, the city of Copenhagen, together with C40 and ECLI, decided to organize a climate summit for mayors parallel to the UN Climate Change Conference. I was very delighted that more than 80 mayors from all over the world decided to participate in this important meeting. New York, London, Tokyo, Rio, Johannesburg, Jakarta, LA, Bombay, and Tehran were among the participants. The global balance was predominant. Mayors from great cities in the north, south, east, and west participated. Cities might be located in different parts of the world, but we face many of the same challenges and goals, and we can in be inspired by each other. So how did the gathering of the many large city mayors at Climate Summit for Mayors contribute to the climate agenda? I believe some of the main conclusions were, and I will just mention four. First of all, it showed that cities were eager to fill the larger role that I have just outlined. And I'm sure that the 80 mayors tried to influence their national delegations. And maybe if they had more influence, we would have had a better result in Copenhagen. Secondly, it showed that despite the problems in the UN track, many of the world's large cities already act. Los Angeles is retrofitting 140,000 of its street lights with lead cluster bulbs. Barcelona has made it compulsory to use solar energy to supply at least 60% of hot running water in new buildings. And London is gearing up to be the electric vehicle capital of Europe. And again, there are many more examples. And what it shows is that cities already act. A third conclusion from the Mayor's Summit shows that many cities would do more if given the legal opportunities. For instance, in Copenhagen, we have lobbied the government for the right to introduce congestion charges and the right to establish environment zones in dense downtown areas where only environmentally friendly cars and trucks should be allowed. I know we share this problem with other cities, that many city administrations are not empowered and or resourced by the national governments in order to help combat climate change. Therefore, it is important to work closely together with the government in our home countries to ensure that there is a link between our effort in the cities and the policy at or on a national level. And a fourth and final conclusion from the summit is that while city administrations are indeed an important mediator for climate change, it is, at the end of the day, the citizens that matter. For me, one of the most important community voices in the climate change debate is the voices 
of the million of citizens living in cities all over the world. To acknowledge the role of the citizens, the City Hall Square in Copenhagen was during the COP15 transformed into a city of hope. So we called it Copenhagen Live. The name was taken from the international Copenhagen campaign, which sought to raise a public demand for a binding agreement in Copenhagen. In adopting the Copenhagen idea, we wanted to ensure that the COP was not just a meeting behind closed doors in the Bella Center, but an event that engaged and informed the citizens. We wanted the citizens to be part of the solution. Every day during the COP15, Copenhagen was filled with real life examples of new climate solutions. From, as one of the minor things, solar heated pancakes, to a Christmas tree lighted by bicycles. And it was a great pleasure to see how eager people were biking to light up the Christmas tree in the dark time in Copenhagen. But there was more serious long-term sustainable solutions as well. Ten cities from the Mayor's Summit were asked to contribute with their best and most innovative solution to the climate challenges for people to come and see. I was pleased that London exhibited one of the new electric poli police cars. An invitation was issued to visitors to experience the challenges and inspirations in the many experience stations. The City Hall Square itself was focusing on the world's climate challenges and the solutions of the future. The Hopen Hagen Live trademark, a huge interactive globe, lighted up the December darkness, reflecting in ever-changing shades and hues the world's engagement with the climate. On the stage, musicians and speakers gave the food for thought to the visitors of Copenhagen Live. We were, on the upset, afraid that a climate fatigue would set in, partly because the Copenhagen Live had a rather technical focus and because climate had been a big issue for such a long time in the news. Yet this was certainly not the case. On the contrary, the following evaluation showed that 350,000 people visited Copenhagen Live in the period and that we could have been even more technical and informative. There was lots of interest and eagerness to learn more. This will be remembered for the next time, and we hope other cities will learn as well. The main idea behind the Hagen Live was really about involving the citizens. Without them in the equation, we will never succeed with solving the climate issues at hand, binding agreements or not. But as you know, a picture can say more than a thousand words, and a video probably even more. So allow me to show you a short video from the Copenhagen Live and Mayor's Summit before moving to a short overview of Copenhagen's hot climate plan.
I hope that uh, the video shows you uh, a little about uh, the feeling and underlined some of my previous points. Now, for cities to be serious partners in overcoming the climate challenges, we must walk the talk. I would hence like to move on to some of the highlights <coughs> of the Copenhagen Climate Action Plan. In mayor times, sounds like a sales pitch for Copenhagen, yet the purpose is truly to be informative so please take it as such. As a first capital in the world, Copenhagen has the ambition to be completely carbon neutral by 2025 starting with a 20% reduction in CO2 just in the period 2005 to 2010. This is surely a great challenge. It comprises 50 specific initiatives within six focus areas. So let me mention a few highlights. The city of Copenhagen will meet 75% of combined CO2 reduction to upgrading its energy supply. This includes the construction of a new combined heat and power system based on renewable energy. It also includes to convert the 100% of coal consumption to biomass in the power plants. So that is the 75%. Then 10% of the CO2 reduction is found through greener transport. This includes a mix of new and improved bike park, green bike routes, bicycle and pedestrian bridges, and better bicycle parking. It also includes to extend our successful and accessible public transport system buses, trains, and monitor. <laughs> so we took away the noise? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> So what I was mentioning, uh, and I will just uh, I'll just state the last point, uh, uh, that was the 10% of uh, CO2 reduction is found through greener transport. Or this includes a mix of new and improved bike park, <laughs> green bike routes, bicycle and pedestrian bridges, and better bicycle parking. It also includes to extend our successful and accessible public transport system with buses, trains, and more metro. And we can go more in details afterwards if you like to. Another 10% is found through more energy efficient buildings, both by giving incentives to retrofit existing buildings and set up clear rules and standards for low energy class buildings in new city areas. And then just 5% is reached by engaging Copenhageners and 1% is found <coughs> through urban development schemes. The plan has proved to be a good guiding document and has not collected dust as words alone. Copenhagen is well on its way to the 2015 target. 97%, as was already mentioned, of all households in Copenhagen are provided with district heating. This is a very energy efficient way to produce heat, as heat from incineration of waste and the surplus heat produced from generating electricity is reused for heating instead of being ejected into the air. 15% of the electricity used to light up the long Nordic nights is generated from windmills, thereby saving 76,000 tons of CO2 annually. Copenhagen also has one of the world's best weight 
waste management system, we have reduced 90% of all building waste and 70% of all household waste. We keep the water quality in a harbor suitable for swimming and we place wind turbines offshore. Over the next decade, a new, large, sustainable, carbon neutral city district will emerge in a former industrial harbor area. As one of the world's most developed cities for bicycling, nearly 40% of our citizens ride a bike to and from work or school every day and at every time of the year, even when it snows. Copenhagen constantly works to improve the facilities for cyclists to make it both easier and safer to cycle in the city. Copenhagen is, for example, integrating the bicycling with other means of transport. A system of bicycling rental close to the railway station is being developed to make it easier to commute from the suburbs to the city in an easy way as an alternative to taking the car. New intelligent transport systems, which is now mostly used to guide traffic by car, is developed to make it safer and more convenient to bike in Copenhagen. We have now green lines for bikes in the rush hour because we have so many bikes that that is necessary. The goal is that in 2015, we want 50% of the Copenhageners to use their bike on a daily basis. I'm confident that we will get there already a couple of years before. These achievements make Copenhagen come out on top of the European Green City Index, published in December 2009. The index is conducted by the Economist Intelligence Unit and sponsored by Siemens. I am, of course, very proud of this and trust Copenhagen will stay on the green track with my fellow Social Democrat Frank Jensen as a new Lord Mayor. As a final topic before the discussion, I would like to highlight our overall way of seeing and planning Copenhagen. The guiding principle is that of quality of life. I'm very pleased that the Monocle magazine named Copenhagen the world's best city for quality of life. The idea is to combine economic growth with cultural and social well-being. We call this, you can have both. With that we mean you can have an interesting work life, but at the same time, you can have a well-functioning family life. You can have a vibrant yet safe city. And you can have a green and climate friendly city, yet a city which keeps a firm focus on the well-being of the citizens and visitors. Arnold Schwarzenegger was speaking, as you saw, at the Mayor's Summit and was asked what he himself did to cut CO2 emissions. He replied that he is now heating his jacuzzi with solar cells and are rebuilding his hummers to run on bio biofuels and electricity. <laughs> While it may be an extreme case, it illustrates two points that will conclude my speech here. That we all must and can act. And secondly, that a greener world can and should be achieved without compromising well-being and life quality of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We now have the opportunity for uh, questions from the floor uh, and uh, one or two comments I'd like to ask you, particularly about how does the but don't answer it now, but just something which I think was of interest as I was sitting there. How, how does this nearly ideal model 
translate elsewhere? I mean, how do the mega cities of the world take what you've said uh, in Mumbai, in Lagos, uh, and elsewhere? And perhaps we can go back to that. But there's a question there. Can you tell us who you are, please? Hello, I'm Erica Thompson from Imperial College. Um, I wanted to pick up just on your very last point there that um, you know, combating climate change needn't mean sacrificing quality of life. And I think that is important. But at the same time, I think it's important also to recognize that um, it's not just about climate change, it's also about resource scarcity. You know, if, if everybody had hydrogen-powered Hummers, actually that isn't a sustainable way of living. So you know, how, do you, how do you see Copenhagen going forward looking at ways of uh, actually making the city sustainable and not just carbon neutral? Because those things are different. very much on, uh, on carbon neutral neutrality and that's why we have put up that plan also because being the host city uh, for the mayor's summit to the uh, COP15 and the COP15, that was really where we had the focus. But I think it goes very uh, closely together with sustainability and what we have been trying to do for the environment. And that was why I was mentioning um, the, uh, the, the waste uh, schemes which has been uh, very, uh, very important. First, the reuse, as I mentioned, we have really reduced uh, the, uh, the problems from, uh, from all the building uh, areas. And uh, we are also experimenting with the household waste, uh, different kind of separation so that people think about, do they really need all those uh, extra packings about the products, uh, they do fill up in those <coughs> dust bins where they have to put it, uh, etc. And um, and I think ec ecology um, is that what you call it? Ecology or mm -hmm. yeah, fine. Uh, is is really uh, very important. We have had a program in uh, Copenhagen for uh, children in schools where we have set up some goals. Uh, first, we started by saying that we wanted to have 50% of all what they were eating uh, being produced ecological. Uh, and we are getting closer. It's, it's, it's tough, but we are getting closer. And nowadays, in, in Denmark, in, in total, uh, one third of all the milk being consumed is uh, ecological. So in that way, we are trying to fill in the different uh, bits and, and pieces, but we didn't make a plan for sustainability, but stayed with the uh, carbon neutral. Question over here. Uh, Philip Brode from LSE Cities. I'm one of the fans of Copenhagen, Ricky referred to before, and I have a question about the relationship between the city and the nation as a whole. As you said, uh, Copenhagen performs rather well and extremely well, in fact, in this latest survey on environmental performance, number one in the Economist survey. At the same time, though, I checked the latest numbers on the ecological footprint for the whole country, for Denmark. It turns out to be the country with the high, second highest ecological footprint in Europe, about 60% about higher than the European average. So I have a question about how far can a city take off with environmental performance independent from its national context? <laughs> it, somehow it's difficult for me to answer because for such a long period I was part of the uh, of Danish government and, uh, and it's quite clear that cities need the government because cities can have a role uh, being giving good examples, uh, taking the lead, being in the front, etc. But I think that goes for all cities all over the world. Then there are national, uh, national legal bindings, uh, which means that you cannot move the way you would like to do as, uh, as a city. So in, in Denmark, and you know we are a very small country, we are only five million uh, inhabitants. In Denmark, there are other cities who do compete with Copenhagen saying that they do exactly as good as we do in Copenhagen. So the competition is about being good, uh, being more sustainable, being more, more CO2 neutral, uh, 
uh, having more ecological uh, performance. And it's uh, highly supported by the population. It's so highly supported that those questions are nearly never a question in election campaigns because all parties agree to it. Then there can be differences between how much effort you put into it really to achieve something new, but the, the mood in the country is uh, to, to go in that direction. And I think it might have to do with um, being such a small country, um, having a system with the good figures where you can really measure that you do better and that you improve your, your standard. And also seeing that as a way of um, competing with, uh, with other countries by being more green. So the, the last part of that has been a, a program for green growth in, in Copenhagen, just to follow up on the uh, CO2 neutral uh, plan for 2025. Can you say a little bit more on that? How, how, is there evidence of a growth in green jobs in Copenhagen or in the district anyway? In the yeah, I think this is just a plan which, which has been uh, newly trying to, uh, to support uh, small innovative uh, companies. We have the same debate as in most countries that people want to live in the cities and then you, have, then you are emptying other areas of the country. How can you uh, provide facilities so that small companies can be up there and add to the groups without adding with more transport, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's a de debate, or I think you have it here too, about how much can we use the EDB and how much can you stay back home and, uh, and do your work and not use all your time and energy for, uh, for transport. Some of the research that I think also Philip was alluding to is that, that we're doing um, seems to point to the fact that while some cities are doing very well in terms of green environmental issues, many of the things you've talked about, that doesn't necessarily translate into a significant growth in number of jobs in green industries, let's call it that. And, and I think that may have something to also do with uh, sort of national issues. No, the gentleman in the second row, then with our hands at the back, yeah. I'll come to you in a moment. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, Dimitris Engelis, also from the LSE. Um, I wanted to pick up on um, some of the points you were just making just now about, um, and, and indeed you, you kicked off your discussion by talking about the search for ultimate causes in all this. Uh, and you were talking about what is it that maybe makes uh, Denmark rather more proactive and progressive on some of these green sustainability issues. And you know, to some extent, it's perhaps no surprise that uh, Copenhagen, but also Stockholm, Helsinki, and Oslo uh, are often cited as exemplary cities from the point of view of both wealth creation, uh, but also uh, good governance and sustainability. So I guess uh, my question is what lessons can be applied more broadly from the perspective of leadership and governance and civic engagement uh, to cities where even though they clearly stand to gain from efficiency and, and other uh, sustainability benefits by applying green policies, it's been much harder to do so. What is it that you might be able to apply from a, from a Danish or a Copenhagen or even a broader Scandinavian model that might be applicable to Lisbon or Lagos or Lahore, uh, you know, cities amongst many that will be much more directly uh, affected by climate change and much sooner uh, than Copenhagen, for example, will be? I think it has very much to do with uh, what, you, uh, what you mentioned yourself, the uh, civic uh, engagement. I think it's very typical that when we have this uh, COP15 in, uh, in Copenhagen, we, we do not think it's acceptable <coughs> for people in Copenhagen that they all stay out there in the Bella Center and what the population in Copenhagen will see is a lot of dark cars driving out and driving back and that's what they know about climate after having that uh, big conference. So instead of that we are trying to see how can you engage Copenhageners in what's going on up there? 
How can we involve them? How can they be part of it? How can they learn from it? And so we spend a lot of money of, uh, of creating all that on the uh, city hall uh, square. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, really a lot of people was in there, children was in there trying to, uh, to figure out. And I think that's part of, you might call it Scandinavian or Nordic uh, idea uh, that you need to take uh, the, uh, the people more closely uh, into the, the uh, into the development, and it's easier because you are smaller, you are closer. We have a very, uh, it's a very, you don't have the distance between uh, between politicians mm -hmm. and ordinary people. Uh, they, they they meet politicians. They see me drive. They they see me take mm -hmm. my bike uh, to being the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen to go to, to the city hall and then they say, okay, there is Rich, she's on her bike, very good. And, and I mean, in, in many other countries, <coughs> this would be impossible. Well, if yeah. the mayor of Mexico City tried to do that, who's speaking here tomorrow night, by the way, at six <laughs> o'clock, uh, he would be shot. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the first to say it. I mean, because of what, so I mean, I think what is behind Dimitri's question and a bit mine at the beginning is, yeah. It, you know, are, are some of these ideas transferable or not? I mean, just as a typical LSE audience uh, of students, I imagine that most of the people in this room come from parts of the world which are vastly urbanizing, that perhaps don't have this sort of um, flat, democratic tradition of civic engagement which allows these things to happen. And let's say our concern might be is that, therefore, can this only happen if you have these conditions? Um, and no. I think... <coughs> no, I don't think so. I'm just mentioning because then... What is possible in, in bigger cities too is to, to make it in areas. I mean, why take all the city? Why not then choose an area and make a more flat structure, involve people more in what's going on? I mean, it can be done. It's just need to be done differently depending on where you are, where you are in, uh, in the world. And there are other cities now really working with bikes. Uh, some of uh, some of the new cities as well trying to plan for bikes from the very beginning and they can go to Copenhagen and they can start it because I think it really matters for us with the bikes that we have those very distinctive bike uh, path it's not only some signals on the road but you really have some stones up there before between the cars and the bikes, which means that people are not afraid that you suddenly have the cars where you are driving. Uh, and this can be learned, and this can be used uh, in other countries. There's a question further on. Yep, the gentleman there. Thank you. Um, to continue that idea of... Oh, sorry, my name's, sorry, my name's Mark Ames. I write the iBike London website, which um, looks at the ways in which we're encouraging cycling here in London, sometimes critically. Um, and to, uh, to continue that idea of transferable ideas, Copenhagen has become uh, a poster boy, a textbook example of how to provide cycling provision. Um, but to build provision for cyclists, such as your wide bike lanes and uh, cycle parking, you must first take away provision for the private automobile, um, which is an idea which maybe isn't very popular here in the UK. How did you sell this idea to your electorate? Um, that's basically my question. Yeah, I think all, all cities and all countries have the fight between car drivers and uh, pedestrians and, uh, and bike uh, cyclists. We also have that. In, uh, in Denmark. But I mean, what many car drivers experience is long, long waiting times. Sitting there, queuing up, and queuing up, and queuing up. And then it gets easier to explain to them that if there was less cars, you don't need to queue. So if there was better possibilities for taking a bike or having a night's bus or building a metro uh, system and you can easily move from one place to another, then 
you will spare hours by using other ways of taking yourself to a job than taking your cars. So what we experience in Copenhagen is that most people have a car, but they use it for weekends in summer houses, and they don't use it for, uh, for daily work. And that really helps. What we have uh, created too, and which I think is important for bikes also, is that we have those bikes where you, in front of the bike, can have some one or two children, driving them to uh, <coughs> kindergarten or nursery uh, garden. And that, because that's another reason for having to use a car is that you need to bring the children and afterwards you have yourself to go to a job and you need a car for doing that. So, okay, no, you don't need a car uh, for doing that. You can do it, uh, you can do it otherwise. And that also creates the debate, I think, uh, which is more connected with the development of the city, the density of the city. The more dense you have a city, the easier it is to have good public transport. And if you at the same time give room for bike park, you have some new possibilities. So that's <coughs> why we are now working on that uh, new area up to Copenhagen to see how far can you go when you do the planning uh, when you when you city park. So in many ways, what you're saying in answer to the question is it was a relatively easy sell. I mean, no, was it your, was I mean, not. Your, your, your concern, I think. <laughs> No, I mean, it, it's, let, let me say that because I really fought to have a congestion charge, which uh, all uh, car drivers hate. Uh, they don't want to have congestion charges. And that was a fight uh, because the government, which is a, a liberal conservative government in Denmark, they wouldn't allow Copenhagen to do it. And it, it was not a popular statement to ask for a, a congestion charge. But it was not that unpopular that the that the new mayor couldn't be couldn't be elected. Over here, and then you next, and then at the back. Yeah. We'll come to you. Yes, uh, Mr. Bonfa. I'm interested in smart cities. I mean, this is a concept that I don't know how how far Copenhagen has gone to. Now, the question is uh, how Copenhagen as a city is related with the strategical, uh, let's say, uh, planning of uh, the Baltic Sea. This means also uh, related with the cohesion policy of the European Union. One, because we are more targeting on city level and you are not connected with the rural area. That means that uh, the rural area should be isolated in such a way and therefore failing the objective of Lisbon strategy. Because I think the city, they should be seen in a perspective of regional development uh, as well as in a perspective of the strategic approach. And my question is, do you have a real vision or strategy for the Copenhagen city? Thank you. Um, were you asking about the relation between the city and the regional yes. uh, country Hinterland. area? Yeah, yeah. 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 okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it is a problem. It is a problem because people nowadays want to live in the cities, so they are moving into the cities. We see it all <coughs> over the world. It's, uh, it's a clear tendency. And that's why uh, a moment ago we were talking about the possibility of keeping workplaces outside in the area which should be possible with uh, all the new possibilities by computers, mobiles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, tough uh, development uh, we are into. In Denmark, we can see it, that you have all those uh, areas where people want to go for holidays, <coughs> but they don't want to stay there. But and the young people don't want to stay there; they want to go to the cities to have a good education. We want them to have a good education. So, uh, I, I do not have. Uh, I do not have solutions uh, to that. Just to, to help us understand, I mean, this is obviously a big issue even in a city like London, which yeah. you, you, know, you, you can have as uh, many wise policies as you want as a mayor, but ultimately you can only control the area which is under the jurisdiction of the mayor, as in your case. 
In Copenhagen, there's a population of what, 700,000? Yeah. But the hinterland maybe is even up to 2 million or, or whatever. Is there a, a, metro, a, a metro region authority that the mayor of Copenhagen talks to to control things like sprawl or uh, unsustainable forms of transport? Because, of course, this is one of the biggest issues. For, I think that was behind your question facing many of the cities mm. uh, around the world. New York City, just to remind many of you in the room, um, is made up of five boroughs with roughly seven million people. But the transit authority is actually uh, determined by the state. And that's why they couldn't get congestion charge in because of uh, different sort of alignments of whose jurisdiction it is. So I was curious whether in your case there is a better alignment or no? no. There are not a better alignment. I think it, it's even getting worse in uh, in Copenhagen. We just changed our our system, and that means that we now have what we call regions with some uh, political uh, parties too. And that means that buses, part of the buses, is in Copenhagen and those little pieces outside, and they should go together and figure it out, and they don't figure it out in a good way. Couple. So, uh, no. Question it's here, not and then two at the back. Uh, my name is Rory Brook. Uh, we've been doing some work for uh, the City Corporation, City of London, looking at uh, building a CHP network for the city. And um, despite the fact that the city has extremely high density of energy consumption, uh, one of our main problems is that there's no certainty of demand of securing customers. And the reason for that is that the UK regulatory framework allows um, competition in choosing who your your supplier is, uh, whereas my understanding of the Scandinavian model for CHP is that it's compulsory uh, for all, all um, buildings, more or less, to be linked into the CHP network, which I believe is usually run by a, well, formerly a state monopoly, and um, I think in some cases by um, monopoly private companies. Um, and welcome your views on um, on the degree to which you think the Scandinavian model uh, is a good one and whether there's areas that it could improve and also the degree to which um, it could be applied to other places and the ways in which it might be modified, say, for example, in the UK context. I think the CHP is central heating. Yes, yeah. Combined yeah. heat and power. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that that's in a way... <laughs> would say it's easy uh, just just to take it in uh, in in other areas and uh, I know it's it's not that easy the way we did it in uh, in Denmark was that we passed a, a legal act in the parliament and we gave uh, the the cities and the regions 10 years where they in that period they would have to have the central heating system and it would be compulsory. Uh, it was not a big political issue. Uh, I think people didn't care that much about where they get the heating from as long as they get it. Uh, and, uh, and it's not been, uh, it's not been very controversial. We are not working uh, to do the same with the cooling and that was not in the act being passed by the parliament uh, back in the 90s. Uh, so now uh, the government has accepted that we do exactly the same with the, with the cooling system. Uh, because we're now, I mean for, for Copenhagen, we didn't need to have a cooling system before, but nowadays we need it for all the computer system, et cetera, et cetera. So now it's more, it's more a question. So I think it is a question uh, whether politicians, governments, uh, city councillors really want it. And uh, compared to the debate about cars and bicycles, which is always very heated, this was never heated. And there's been some pressure now to get rid of the coal and to get the biofuels instead of. Uh, and, and that's a way where you can really change the CO2 when you have the central heating system, because then you decide what kind of uh, material you're using. Question over there. 
Hi, Steve Shaw, a uh, London resident. Uh, I was just wondering what, in your opinion, are the key changes that you think London needs to make now in, in the immediate moment, but then also changes that you think would be needed to make, be made in, in the longer term as well in order to see us reducing our climate emissions? I do not know. I do not You're know. You're not mayor anymore. Come. You can speak. It's fine. You can Yeah, tell but us. I mean, I, I really don't know London uh, good enough. Uh, I'm sure you have some very active NGO people here in London, too, who has a lot of projects, who really knows what will be needed, and, and, and you need to build, uh, to build on that. As I was mentioning uh, earlier on, you really need to have that connection with uh, what's in the head, what's in the mind of, the, of people in, uh, in London. And you cannot have a mayor from Copenhagen. I, I can give you some inspiration, some ideas, and telling how we're dealing with it. And then you and others need to do the job yourself. What are the two things you think we should do? Back to the question. Yeah, two. Five. Not five. Two things. What do I think? Two. Like. two. Um, Okay, one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see a much more comprehensive cycle lane system um, in, in the shorter term. In the longer term, I'd like to see a much more substantial um, taxing of uh, higher emitting vehicles. I'm, I'm fascinated how cycling is seen as, in a way, the solution to everything. But I'm, no, I'm, but I, I, I think that the I mean, there are other issues. Well, again, okay, I gather quite a lot of you do. That's I, but I think the, the, the yeah. idea of why, why cycling is is coming up all all the time is because it's it's so visible. I mean, and it's so clear that you need to go to your job every day. So it it, it becomes a very very clear symbol that the, that there are choices. But, but London is at, at some oh, point know, sixty kilometers wide, oh, yeah. and some people commute. So there are some issues which, uh, lady at the top, and then I think two more questions before we wind up. Three, maybe. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Thuy. I work at Ernst & Young. Um, I have a question about the district heating systems which you mentioned that cover 97% of all households. First, first sort of part of the question is how the economics of that stack up um, as well as sort of who funds it, how does that work? And secondly, on the sort of logistics, so I know that one of the big problems with district heating tends to be that where the heat comes out of factories and so on and so forth does not tend to be where the residential areas are. So just wondering how that worked in Copenhagen. Did you hear the last time? I, I am afraid I couldn't hear that. <coughs> Sorry, I'll speak a bit louder. Make, no, make it um, the, the last part of it, I didn't catch that. So the first part was on the how the economics of yeah. the district no, heating no, systems no. stack up. The second part was on the logistics. So I know a big problem in the UK tends to be that where heat is generated does not tend to be where the residential areas are located. So how did you go about connecting up the sort of supply and demand? I'm not, I'm not really an expert uh, on that, I, I will have to admit. Uh, the system in, uh, in Denmark is that uh, the energy system was once part of the Copenhagen. It was owned, so to say, by the city council and made out as a special entity. And now it's been... No, I think I'm, I'm not really able to, uh, to, explain, uh, to explain the system and how it functions. Okay. So I think I better, in case it really matters, I'm sure I can send you some materials on it, but I'm not an expert on it. Thank you for that. Sorry. Hi, Neil Dobson. I run a consultancy in the sport and sustainability space. Um, where I was really interested is where business connected into this. So we've heard about the civic and the population, and we've heard about government. We haven't heard at all about the sort of third tier, which is business. So was it, would a lot of these solutions very business-centric and business-driven, or was it legislation that actually forced business to come with you on the journey? So for example, in London, one of the major issues about cycling to work is the distances and therefore things like showers in the office places. And recycling is, is a, you know, to a certain degree, is driven by how green that business wants to be. 
So where did business fit in in the Copenhagen model? I think uh, business in a way matters more when you talk uh, on a national level. Uh, and uh, th there is a clear tendency in Denmark that business wants to be green. Uh, so they want to provide facilities for uh, people who take their bikes. They want to, uh, to be part of the development with, uh, with me too, or facilities where you can bike part ways and then take, uh, then take the, uh, the public uh, transport uh, system. There's, there's not been any kind of uh, real controversy with the, with the business sector. I mean, they are complaining that there are too few uh, parking spots in Copenhagen. But I mean, you will hear that always. <coughs> Even though we make more of them, there will always be too few of them. But in general, I would say it's been, it's been a common tendency to what uh, to be green. And that about now changing, for instance, the uh, central heating system from coal uh, to biomass was a decision made by the company itself. Because I think of the mood in, in, uh, in the country, but it, it was not by uh, any legal act, they just decided themselves. A couple more questions, I think one. Hi, and is he on? Uh, Andrea Clanton from LSE Cities. I was wondering whether in Copena if in Copenhagen's history there was um, a turning point for the city to move towards zero emissions as a city. I mean, did it happen in five years or what was the, the catalyst for this change? I think it was mainly because, I mean, we have had environmental programs for many years. I think it was, uh, we were the first country who had a minister for environment back in the 70s. And so in the city of Copenhagen, there's been a lot of the programs for sustainability and environment. And now, being the host city for the COP15, we just fe felt that we had to do something and we had to come up with a plan which was very ambitious. And what was interesting is that this uh, being carbon neutral by uh, 2025 was a common agreement with all parties in the city council in, uh, in Copenhagen. They, they, they simply all agreed to it. And everybody is willing to try to, to reach it. <coughs> okay, gentlemen, <laughs> sorry, just further back on the fifth row and then last question at the front. My name is Joschkant, I'm from Germany. Well, when I walk around through London and I look at the living houses, when I see the windows, this is all single glasses, old, build, old, old standard. In Germany, we have double glasses, very good isolating, and I think this is also a very important point, not only to change the heating system, but yeah, to make it more efficiently, that if, if I warm the house, yeah. I think you are, you are absolutely uh, right. It, uh, it really matters uh, to use energy uh, for insulation. I think it was done in, uh, in Copenhagen very much during the energy crisis in the 70s, because there we were passing a lot of legal acts to how to go into buildings, and there was me, uh, there was money for uh, changing windows, etc. And that's true. Here in London, it's really bad. <laughs> I think. Wait. Okay. One question over there, and then we'll come to the another. Five Hi. Uh, my name is Yonsha. Um, I'm a student here at LSE as well, and I'm interested. In um, Rit, how does Copenhagen communicate its vision about being a green and sustainable city? Is it more presented as a challenge to its citizens from Copenhagen or actually to a challenge to all citizens all over the world from different cities as well? Because on the administrative level, you s the cities are already obviously cooperating, but that is actually, um, well, I wonder whether that is communicated as well to the citizens um, or not? 
I think that was really what was uh, great about the, uh, the mayor's summit in, uh, in Copenhagen. As I mentioned, I was negotiating as a commissioner for environment in Kyoto. And at that time, it was not head of state. It was the uh, environment ministers. It was John Prescott uh, here from, uh, from UK. Lord Prescott. Uh, Lord Prescott, sorry. <laughs> uh, who together with uh, me was uh, the, the main uh, negotiators. And there was nothing about cities, not a word about cities. And now here in, in Copenhagen, there was 80 mayors from all over the world. And what was fascinating too was that a lot of the American uh, cities, they were stating that they themselves would meet the Kyoto demands, even though it was impossible uh, for Clinton to get it through in the Senate. So I think what happened in Copenhagen was that feeling from cities, okay, okay, maybe those national governments, they cannot agree to anything here, but we are able to do something in our cities, and we are able to communicate with each other, learn from each other, and build on that system. And a lot of people now know each other, and it's not only the politicians, because as you know, there is a, a big job before politicians meets with all the people, all different kind of bureaucrats working together. They know each other, they can work together, and they can continue to work together. So I think this has really improved the communication and the knowledge about what's possible. But I think this is something for uh you read too, difficult to answer, but the best communication is a good mayor who knows how to talk. And, and this is not just you. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, the, the examples of many of the cities from Bogota to uh, even London, um, they're a forceful, vociferous, committed mayor who gets in front of the cameras and makes videos with Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, th th these are very important things uh, which have put cities on a completely different uh, level of communication. Ian Ritchie. Uh, Ian Ritchie, I'm here uh, with the Arab Foundation. Um, you talked about climate fatigue at some moment during your talk, and I think it's something which perhaps is reflected in the audience here, that you've got one of the leading lights, if you like, political lights in the European dimension, if not the world dimension, talking about the city and climate change, yet the audience here is not full. Now that suggest to me there's a bit of climate fatigue in the UK. You've indicated, if you like, a 30, 40 year cultural evolution within the Copenhagen people and perhaps the Danish people, probably starting with the, the kindergarten and the children. And you've illustrated a whole number of ways that you seem to have addressed the issue of, if you take the previous question, communication, but also sustaining the interest. And you do that by, I, I said, sensed uh, an aspect which I didn't know the, the Danes had, which was this kind of competitive instinct to compete with each other, and perhaps with other cities and other peoples in the world. And you threw up challenges quite a lot. Are you suggesting that there is, in fact, the evolution of the economy is one with, towards uh, competitive altruism, and that may be a new economy that we're looking at? And if you were to turn the whole question round, if you were to look at London and come up with one suggestion to overcome climate fatigue amongst its citizens in London, what would you suggest? I have one idea, which has come out of this evening, but I'd like to know if you have one. I, I think you're absolutely uh, right about mentioning, and we haven't, worked, uh, we haven't discussed that very much here tonight, but obviously there are a climate fatigue, and that was also why I mentioned that the next two COPs will definitely not go any further, I think. Uh, so much was put into um, Copenhagen, and uh, maybe it was wrong uh, to ask head of states to go there, uh, because it just put it up in, uh, in a way where it wasn't really possible. Maybe if you had stayed as we did in Kyoto, with some of the ministers, there was better possibilities. But that was what happened and now we have this kind of uh, climate uh, fatigue. I think as was asked, I think it was one of the first uh, questions to me, uh, 
um, looking at sustainability. Instead of taking, taking, let's say, climate a little out of the political debate and talk about all those elements, what goes into climate, such as sustainability, ecology, um, way of living, etc., instead of as a um, as a political debate, might be wiser. Great, thank you very much for that. I'd like to really conclude uh, the evening by uh, reminding you of a couple of forthcoming talks, um, and uh, before we thank our speaker. Um, tomorrow night, as I say, the mayor of Mexico City will be here at 6 o'clock, one of uh, a series of uh, talks organized by LSE Cities. Um, I also want to let you know that Rem Coolhouse, the architect uh, and urban designer who was due to speak here on the 21st of June, has had to cancel. So if any of you were planning to camp out here the night before, don't. Um, and um, I also want to conclude by really thanking the OVAR Foundation for uh, organizing this event. We had to, in fact, cancel because of volcanic ash. One of the other speakers in the series who's the commissioner uh, for transportation in New York, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, but she will be coming back, in fact, in uh, October as uh, the third part of the series. Um, but I'd like you to join me in thanking uh, the mayor of Copenhagen for a very generous time with us uh, and for extraordinary stewardship of cities. Thank you very, very much.